How comfortable are you sharing your uh, Carl's Jr. story? Carl's Jr. Was it a Carl's Jr.? Or was it a Wendy's? Who are you talking to? You, dog. Me? Oh, I thought you were talking to Sean. Yeah, I was like, I What are you talking about, Carl's Jr. Carl's or Wendy's? In St. George. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you want to hear the the? Tell her. Okay, first Wait, of all, what was the restaurant first? Yeah, which one was it? It was Wendy's. Uh, okay, yeah, I was, I was like, gonna Carl's say that's a, that's a, that's a broke fuck? boys restaurant. It's <laughs> Wendy's. <laughs> so if there's anyone out there who's like a starving artist, <laughs> or anyone who's like thinking about should I take a chance on my dream, this story's for you. <laughs> I hear you. I feel you. <laughs> if you don't want to share, you don't have to. <laughs> nah, I'll share. Uh, a few years ago, I wanted to move to Los Angeles because Los Angeles is just the best place for creators, at least in the entertainment industry. And I wanted to be around that. Had some friends there. It was great. So I had a pretty labor intensive job there while I... Uh, and it started as soon as I got to Los Angeles and while I was there, it wasn't a job like in the creative field you wanted to be in. It was just like simply to, so that you could eat and sustain your life. No. Yeah. It was really just to make money and uh, do what I wanted to do on my off time. And while I was there, um, went and played soccer with some friends and there was legit like a a dip in the I don't know a hole in the ground, and I sprained my ankle, <laughs> and I couldn't work at my job anymore. So here I am in Los Angeles with a couple hundred bucks in my bank account left, <laughs> and I get let go from my job. <laughs> You're following so your I, dream of following. breaking into the music industry. <laughs> and I cannot survive there financially. So what do I do? <laughs> Decide to pack everything back up and move right back to Utah from where I came. <laughs> and on the way home, I stopped in a town called St. George it's in southern Utah. Famous for... Their red rock arches, national parks. Being close to Hurricane and Leverkin. And because I need to save money, I wasn't trying to spend a lot. So I stopped at Wendy's and it was raining and I hopped myself out of the car with my crutches. <laughs> it's like pouring rain. You have to like get out of your car and hop around and grab your crutches. <laughs> Desert yeah. too. Yeah. What the hell is the rain there for? Yeah. <laughs> It like never rains in St. George, but it was raining for me <laughs> and it's pouring rain and I get on my crutches and I get inside and I get my four for four junior, <laughs> junior bacon cheeseburger. And, uh, the person didn't even help me with my tray. <laughs> so I had like a fanny pack like around my shoulder and I just like put everything in the fanny pack and like crutched my way over to it. <laughs> One, one of the tables, <laughs> wet <laughs> and poor and shattered, dreams. shattered dreams <laughs> and ankle, and ankle. <laughs> and I told the one person that I was coming back to Utah, and it was I think Jordan, and I was like, "Yo, dude." <laughs> Can I just crash on your guys' couch for a little bit till I get back on my feet? <laughs> like, my foot? Like, <laughs> quite literally. <laughs> and, like, financially in life. <laughs> He's like, yeah, dude, for sure. Come and stay in. Got to the house and everyone thinks I'm in L.A. And everyone's... Literally, everyone was so excited for me. <laughs> because they're like, you're going to go... Like you're gonna make it. It was a big send off. It was like a big thing. We had like a going away thing, and we're like, "Dude, big up on you for following your dreams. Like being so brave, dog. Like you got this. You're gonna make it, bro." And then <laughs> the DJ's sitting there, and like so everyone's out that day that I get that I get back to their house, and 
I think everyone gets home at once <laughs> in one car. I don't know where they were. And I'm there. <laughs> and everyone's just like, what the? <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> I remember being mad excited. I was like, what? I'm like, hi, dude. <laughs> I just thought you were visiting. <laughs> I feel like I also thought you were visiting. Oh, I, I was. I have been visiting. <laughs> the past four years have been a long visit. How's your ankle? Back to Utah. <gasps> what? Oh, frick, dude. This happens every time. Huh. I have an app called Be My Eyes. Yeah. Which is cool. And it's basically... Like a video chat for oh, blind people. Yeah. And when they need help with like a a task, then they open the app and I get to like see for them and tell them what to do or help them with whatever they need done. And I just got a call and I answered it and it said somebody else answered. Dang. Dang. Welcome, this is the 3 a.m. podcast. He's Sean. And he's Charles. And that over there is DJ. <laughs> that that thing. Yeah, um, this is where we get together, tell each other scary stories. So if you want scary stories, you're in the right place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that story. So if you're out there and you're afraid to follow your dreams, don't be afraid. It can't be as bad as DJ's experience. <laughs> <laughs> Sad boy times, honestly. That was the best. I didn't you say you were just sitting there like soaking wet, eating your Wendy's and like just sad. half laugh, ha- laughing, laughing, but like, laughing. Yeah, how sad life. I is. wasn't. Yeah, I was. I was like, I usually laugh when I'm nervous or a- everything, but that's how I cope. <laughs> just laugh at myself. <laughs> there you go. Just sitting in the Wendy's. So every time we like drive south. <laughs> we go through St. George and we see that Wendy's. You have to relive that. Yeah. I see me hobbling over, putting the food in my fanny pack. <laughs> anyway, so if you ever hear us make ankle jo- jokes at DJ, that's why. Ugh. I've sprained and rolled my ankle so many times and broken it twice. Ugh. So, it's fun. <laughs> All right, let's oh. do question time. What is the scariest story you know that is 100% true? I read that <laughs> on the internet, so. True. Gotta be true. Facts. 100. Uh, the reason they changed refrigerators from the lock me- mechanism to the magnetic yeah, yeah. one is because too many kids were locking themselves inside accidentally. And a bunch of them died. I could see that. I haven't heard anything that happened like that, but I could see it. Imagine playing hide and go seek. Hiding and someone f- dying. And you open the fridge to hide in, but that person was still playing their last game of hide and seek oh. from 50 years ago. <laughs> okay, well, who's not using that fridge for 50 years? <laughs> Everyone's grandma and grandpa. I'm just thinking of like a junkyard. Oh, True, but still, you go to your grandparents and there's stuff from like four years ago in there, and you're like, oh, <laughs> "That's a specific situation." Dude, my dad, <laughs> I actually was on a phone call with my dad on the way here, and I was talking to him, and I was like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "I'm cleaning out my fridge. I found something from 2008." <laughs> <laughs> Case in point, dude. dude. I was like, "What?" <laughs> I've cleaned so many fridges since then. It's wild. Yeah. <laughs> Every cleaning check. Question, what would you do to defend yourself if someone broke into your house? And I'm going to use your house right now or your house that you grew up in. Okay. Give me a little more context. Are you in your room? What's happening? Upstairs, downstairs? You yeah, know you're in your room. It's in the middle of the night. What? So you like hear someone come in? You don't know who is it who it is? No. So like it could be you. Sure. Yeah, I think step 1 is um confirm it's a break in. 
True. In this situation, it's a break in and they're going to hurt you. Okay. You have to defend yourself. The reason <laughs> I say confirm it is, is because we have a friend who was almost shot in the face by his dad who thought it was a break in. So the second I, I would grab a weapon. I'm kind of a paranoid person. So I always keep a bat at the very least in my room. In the past, I've had brass knuckles, trench spikes, um, bats on chains. <laughs> I've had <laughs> uh, riot batons from Thailand, tasers, uh, knives, all. You're the cool kid growing up, huh? <laughs> this, is, this never actually happened to me, and it's not real, and it's allegedly. But when I was 16, for my birthday, my sister got me a trench spike. What that is is brass knuckles with a huge fixed blade that comes out the end. And she got it from her cop friend out of the evidence room. And she gave it to me in the middle of a restaurant <laughs> where I was having my 16-year-old <laughs> oh year, birthday dinner. And when I took it home that night and I was cleaning it with like brass, so this is what it's called, to like make it shine. Uh, a ton of blood came out the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, there you go. Well, damn. Wild. Side story, allegedly. When I was coming home from the Philippines, I went to uh, one of my friends who was from there. And I was like, yo, take me to the spot where they sell all the cool stuff. And he looked at me. He's like, okay, yeah, <laughs> I got you. <laughs> so we go down to the Changi. Um which is the the market, the mercado. Mm. And he knows what he's doing. He walks directly to this specific shop and the man sees him. And as soon as a man sees the the owner of this little shop and there's hundreds, you know, it's like a, just think of like Southeast Asia, you know, a market in town. It's busy. It's bustling. It smells like fish and raw meat. And there's lots of weird Different stuff all around, and uh, the man sees him, and he sees me, and he smiles. <laughs> He's like, he tells us to come. Payday. <laughs> he tells us to come. And we walk up to him. He turns around, and he grabs the curtain behind him and pulls it. He says, come into the back. <laughs> oh. oh. So <laughs> and we walk to the back, and there's just a wall, and I bought everything. <laughs> One of everything. I bought a cockspur, which is for fighting chickens. Nice. This is also all alleged, <laughs> by the way. Everything that I'm it's saying it's right here. It's a book you read or something? Yeah. yeah. Uh, a cockspur, like the Philippines is huge into cockfighting. Um, and it's, yeah, the blade that the chickens have on their leg, on their talon. And it slices clean through the other chicken's head. Holy. It's crazy. And I got my name engraved on it. <laughs> <laughs> got a cockspur. I got a switchblade. Oh, I got a butterfly knife. Oh, I've had one of those from Spain. And brass knuckles. Apparently, nice, nice. And I was real stoked about it. And uh, got some luggage and an airplane. And got home. <laughs> That's what I would use to defend myself. Hmm. I would put the cockspur on my my ankle. <gasps> I'd scotch tape it oh. real quick, <laughs> slap yeah. it on, yeah, <laughs> and uh, tape all the other weapons to my fingers. Ooh, scary! I would uh, greet this person with a nice firm handshake and lead him upstairs. Open the room on the left, take him to the back, and say. My mother's a LuLaRoe retailer. <laughs> Would you like to uh, purchase any leggings? <laughs> and very nice black. You'll never be spotted. <laughs> I'll be like, hey, hon, it's been years since we've talked. <laughs> and his sheer fear of uh, multi-level marketing will make him tremble. Damn. And that run. is the scariest defense mechanism I've heard of. Dude, what I'd do is I'd throw down some... Uh, Christmas ornaments and RC cars. <laughs> Maybe some tar and a and a nail. <laughs> Heat all the doorknobs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some bricks from the top floor. Yeah. There you go. 
<laughs> I don't know. It's hard. It, it's all situational. Like if I'm near the kitchen, I'm grabbing a butcher knife. I'm going to, I'm going to stab. I'm going to protect me and mine to the death. Uh, if I'm at home, there might be some firearms around, but it's kind of tricky. Cause you hear those stories about like that person who was trying to rob that old lady. He fell through the roof with like a kitchen or a window, like a skylight over the kitchen he fell and cut his leg on a knife in her kitchen and sued her sued her and won yeah so there's been a, a bunch of stories him. like that yeah. you you can't like booby trap your home that's like illegal i don't know if it is in every state or if it's like interesting yeah because of that yeah you just got to kill them so they can't sue you <sighs> i'd scream in terror i don't know and and fight to the death with anything available to me. I'd kill him. <laughs> Your bare hands. Fuck dick. Oh. <laughs> and with that, I gotta pee. <laughs> I have a pocket knife right by my bed. All right, cool. So let's go ahead and roll. Eleven. What the F? Evan, Sean, and stupid ass. Twenty. Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> oh, did we get the same thing again? Yeah. Uh, Seventeen. <laughs> Perfect. You, you, me. <laughs> All right. So, order tonight is Sean, Charlie, DJ. So, I heard a story earlier this week about a couple friends that went camping. And this was from some of my friends back east. So this was like out in the Smoky Mountains area and stuff like that. Now, it was supposed to be a large group of friends. And slowly, before they are about to go out camping, friends just start backing out. So it was went from, I think, six or seven people to just two. So two of the these guys decided to go out camping somewhere in the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. And it's <clears throat> close to kind of a smaller town, but outside it, like an hour outside of this small town, just out in these mountains. They uh, get... To They get to their spot and they start hiking in to this forest a little bit and get to a place where they're like, hey, yeah, this would be a cool spot to set up and make a fire and camp here. So they stop, they set up their tents, they start the fire. And kind of the funny thing about starting fires out in the woods is it kind of attracts other people if they're passing by hiking or like you're totally visible to everybody at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they start cooking some dinner and as they're doing this, a couple other guys come up this trail and they're like, Hey, how's it going? And they just kind of spark up a conversation with them and really just small talk. But one of these friends kind of decides that he has a really weird feeling about him. And after they leave, he tells the other friend, he's like, yeah, I also had a really weird feeling about these guys. So what they did is they put out the fire, packed up their tent, and they hiked up a little bit further up to this ridge that was kind of up near the top of the mountain that they were by, and if you hiked probably like 50 feet away from their new campsite, they could look down and be, they were able to see their old campsite. They set up their tents, go to sleep. And like late, late at night, one of the friends wakes up for no reason in particular. And he kind of gets up, gets out of the tent, goes pee, and then realizes he kind of sees like these flashing of lights. So he hikes the 50 feet or whatever away from the new campsite. Like a, like a flashlight? Yeah. Oh, okay. 
So just like, you know how you have like that mm-hmm. yeah, flashlight, the, the flickering. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. He hikes these, the 50 feet away from the campsite and looks down at the other campsite and sees like three or four people just with flashlights flickering around their old campsite. He goes back, gets his friend, wakes him up. They both go and look, and they can tell just with the flickers of light, though, that these men were, like, holding baseball bats. And they had, like, their flashlights and baseball bats, and they're just, like, rummaging around where their old campsite had just been. So after, like, paying attention to this for a minute or two, they decide they're just going to take watch, and one would watch and make sure while the other one slept and just rotate back and forth that night. So they did that, and honestly, they probably thought, or the like the guys who showed up, they figured that they were just drunk. But either way, they were now at their camp with just baseball bats and these flashlights, and at eventually 2 or 3 in the morning, they all left. Ugh. And after they, like that morning afterwards, they packed up their tents and left. They figured it was just locals, but you never know out in the woods. Fortunately, they both survived, but that's hella scary. Bro, that instantly I think of Darby, Montana, dog, (laughs) (laughs) where we went. (laughs) Good hell. When we walked into that bar and every single head turned and looked at us and the needle scratched and the music stopped, I was like, deliverance. (laughs) We need to get out of here. <laughs> For real. Oh. Oh, yeah. That's exactly what I thought of too, actually. Um, being in Montana. <laughs> <laughs> Freak, dude. I think that's like the only thing you can do. Take turns watching. True. I, I don't think I would sleep though. From like the description they told me, it sounded like they were far, far enough away to where... Mm they wouldn't have realized that they left and they went up this mountain, but they could see them down in the kind of the valley there, like with their flashlights and baseball bats, apparently. Huh? If that's the case, then yeah, I think I'd be okay with taking shifts. Yeah. I probably still wouldn't be able to sleep though. If we're being (laughs) honest, if we're being honest, I'd, I would lay there hella anxious. Like if we're, even if we were taking shifts, I'd go back to my tent and be like, you hear a snap of a, I love stories like that and hate them because, like, I love camping. Yeah, I know. Ugh, camping, you're just so vulnerable. Like, that's the biggest red flag or like issue that I have is when you're out in a place that you're unfamiliar with and something happens, you're vulnerable. Usually, reception's gone. Yeah, and if you're unprepared for anything like that, like you're screwed. Yeah. freak the thing that scares me more like we talk about like cryptids and like spirits and stuff like that what scares me is real people me too. out in the woods like if in the in this scenario if there were four or five people i probably would have tried fighting them and i probably would have gotten beaten up or worse Oof. but that's more like scary to me because it's something that I feel like can actually physically harm me. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. I know what you're saying. <laughs> I'm already mentally harmed enough, so like I ain't got worried about that. <laughs> you know that that's real. Yes, if that makes sense. It's just something very present and real to me. Huh. On that note, though, I mentioned a couple times now to I think both of you is that there's a uh, developing story. <sighs> You son of a gun, I swear. (laughs) I'm going to... Is it still developing? I mean, it is still developing. Oh, okay. But I'm going to tell you what I know so far. Okay. So, let me tell you. I have a friend at work. And beginning October 1st, this year, things started happening at their house. So, she is... I think renting a room with a roommate in this three bedroom apartment. She's been living there for two years now, as far as I know. So she mentioned on October 1st, she was coming out of her room, going to the kitchen area one early morning because she comes to work early. But 
they have like this long dark hallway that has the bedrooms lined up and it gets to a living room and kitchen area and then exit I think kind of in that order so she's coming out down this hallway and she said that as she gets to like an area in the hallway where she can see into her living room she sees a shadow sitting on her couch and first of all she's just like it's probably the sun playing like tricks as it's coming in my window and she gets a little bit closer and it's something visibly sitting there on her couch <laughs> now she also i believe is a skeptical person in this in this area so what she told me was she uh tried to recreate what she saw after it disappeared and couldn't recreate it exactly how she saw it. What do you mean she tried to recreate it? She like tried to like put pillows up and like like so that it would seem like someone was sitting there. I think she even asked her roommate to sit there or whatever. But tried to recreate what she saw and couldn't. Because you could almost see through that that shadow, but it was something that was sitting there on the couch. Oh, that's spooky. The house that Sean and I just moved into and I'm still getting used to the house and downstairs there's one of the lights just went out like a couple <laughs> days ago and there's like just like a, a coat rack and <laughs> my friend has his hat on the coat rack. Every time I go downstairs within the past couple days, I turn the cor- like I come downstairs and then I go around the corner to my room and since there's really not any light i see that hat. And like <laughs> it freaks me out every time so it's the babadook in the corner <laughs> yeah i'm afraid that one day i'm gonna like turn on the light and it actually is something <laughs> after convincing myself that it's just a hat so i i see i can relate to what that that girl is going through but she's been there for a couple of years yeah so. so it's been two years that they're living there and she says the first time that this happened was october 1st and she swears by this she swears by it because it okay like it's it's h- hard for me to just believe right off the bat cuz that's weird just it is walking weird. into the room and then seeing it sitting on the couch and she described it as looking like a man or like i have more to the story okay i'll be quiet <laughs> all of your questions shall be answered <laughs> okay so this whatever it is and she she thinks it's confused she doesn't think that it's a uh, a violent spirit by Malicious. any means. Yeah, she thinks that it's confused because in another instance, it didn't show up as a spirit. It showed up as like an like a glowing orb. So w- the way she described it is she was in her room and this orb kind of popped up in the middle of her room and went through her kind of desk. There's this mirror on the desk. It went through the mirror and into the wall. Now, she's just like, okay, this is weird. But then she asked her roommate about it. And her roommate said, yeah, something came through my side of the, like, came through the wall and into my room. And it was like this orb or whatever. So the Mm. roommate's also seeing whatever this is. And all she had to say for it was, that was weird. (laughs) I mean... This is freaking the f out, <laughs> no, <same. laughs> especially like, because I went hard on orbs the other day. <laughs> so, like, if they start haunting me, I'm gonna be. Uh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're not dust. <laughs> so, but also the both of them are seeing whatever this entity is, and she, that's why she says she thought it was confused, just because it was manifesting in different ways. <sighs> now, another day or two later. She uh, said she woke up and heard like a sound or whatever. So she goes out of her room and starts going down the hallway. And there's three rooms, but there's only two roommates right now. So one of the rooms is vacant. And she walks past this room and sees as she's walking past, something inside the room go the other way. Ew. And then she went and looked, flipped on the light, and there was nothing there. Here's the thing. Once you start seeing things, once you start hearing things, I feel like it's always a landslide. Like you just hear, you start seeing and hearing more and more. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Ugh, I've been in that position with like the house I've grown up with. It started with one thing, thought it was weird. Then another thing happened. And then all of a sudden it's like, 
every you know it's just happening so much yeah but wait there's more (laughs) keep going okay so when she's telling me this story as the infinite skeptic that i am my first thought is how come now you've been living there for two years yeah she said that she just recently started practicing little wicca what (laughs) just recently (laughs) what does that remind me wicca yeah yeah that, is that the same as like Wiccans? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So but, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Go go over it again. You go over it, and then I'll share if I know anything. So, else. in to my understanding, what she's practicing is more just the like the spirits and stuff. The spiritualism. The side. spiritualism of Wicca or Wiccans or Are these the same people who do like seances. I don't think it's like only Wiccans the do people? seances. Yeah, but they but do. They do. Yeah. My as as understanding know. of Wicca is it's like a very like earthly believing in like, you know, earthly things. So like seasons, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It's like a very nice version of witchcraft. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're just, I'm speaking straight out of my butthole right now. So I honestly <laughs> don't know a whole lot about <laughs> the specifics. I just know that it is a uh, spiritual like religion or something along those lines wicca how do you spell that w-i-c-c-a c-c-a mm-hmm. yeah hmm. with that being said it was just recently that she started like looking into that at all and funny enough the desk and mirror that this orb passed through going into her roommate's room was the desk where she had all of her stuff set up on got you so it was like almost going through a portal, almost. Like I have no idea how that works, but that's what it seems like based on the story. Now, so that was the ninth. I talked to her on the ninth, and she said that that night she woke up, and she said it was 2.30 a.m., and she saw a shadow standing at the end of her bed. Now, I start asking all kinds of questions when this happened. She said that it seemed like the shadow of a man that had like really broad shoulders. And she described it as appearing to be wearing a trench coat or something like that. I was like, uh, you got a real problem now. Yeah. (laughs) Is she concerned now? I mean, I don't know what level she's concerned, but she's like, yeah, we're definitely staging the house on Friday. And I have yet to follow up with her on that. Ooh. But it is still a developing story to my knowledge. And they're planning on saging the house. Sure. <laughs> or they should have already saged the house. That <laughs> is the story to the point that I know. Here's some thoughts from me real quick. Right. She should be more concerned. <laughs> a, I agree. I'm not feeling any sort of urgency from her None at all. whatsoever. And it's concerning. Okay, if I saw a shadow like on my couch, my first thought as well would be like, it's a trick of the light. I'm going to try and recreate it. That wouldn't concern me. I'm with you there. Enter orb. (laughs) That would be a little concerning to me because it could also be a trick of light. But enter orb that not only I see, but roommate saw. That's more concerning. A little more concerning. Enter shadow in room walking the opposite direction of you and then nothing being there. That's when changes need to be made. Well, true, but that also could be like... I feel you. Something standing at the edge of my bed. Well, red, flag, red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag. Uh-huh. And saging that apartment. Yeah, I'd be eating or Palo Santo. For real. <laughs> And burning I would just buckets keep like of a sage. chunk by the side of my bed, and if I see the shadow, I'll just throw it. Yo, at you it. should tell her to listen to our episode with Caroline. Yeah, tell her to put a bowl of salt under her bed, <laughs> or tell her to prick her finger and put it in, in a cup Ooh, near. Yeah, dude. And if it's empty Maybe in the morning, a, she needs to go genie. to Morocco. Never had a friend <laughs> like the. <laughs> it's a gin. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> Whose turn? Yours. Oof. Okay, real quick. This is a quick story, but uh, because of your question. So one of my cousin's friends growing up, he was in like seventh grade. And he came home early from school. 
Uh, he had like a short period or something. So he came home hella early. He was the only one home. He gets inside, lays down in his couch, and he just goes to sleep. And after a while, he's woken up. He opens his eyes. He's lying on the couch. And he hears upstairs some sort of like thud. So he's sitting there, and he hears another harder, louder thud. So he like stands up. And he can hear light footsteps in the room above him. And so he walks out, walks into like the main area of his house where he can look up the stairs, turns the corner, he looks up and he just sees his sister's room and the door's wide open. Mm -hmm. And Standing in the middle of the room is a man he doesn't recognize. And he said he's instantly paralyzed with fear. And as he is realizing that there's someone in his house, this person is just looking through his sister's stuff and then turns around and stares right at him. And the guy just stares at him, slowly turns around and just shuts the door. (laughs) And so he said he ran into the kitchen, called 911, told him there's an intruder at their house. And ran outside. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and so he, like the police come and they look and there is a freaking like rain gutter pipe that goes up the side of his house. This guy had climbed it and punched through his sister's open window um, screen mm-hmm. and just climbed in. Well, damn. And did he see him climb out? No. He said the guy just closed the door he said he didn't move quickly at all like he wasn't alarmed he saw him downstairs saw him see him turn slowly grab the door and just shut the door slowly hmm. uh, they searched the house he wasn't there he had taken off but uh bro next time that happens i'm throwing up one of these before <laughs> he closes the door <laughs> so sean flips him off slowly as he slowly closes the door <laughs> but dude like <laughs> as a seven year he said like it's not like a terribly scary story because nothing happened, but um, that's it, still terrifying. It messed him up for a really long time. He ha- he couldn't be home alone. He and it ultimately they ended up moving because of it. He Whoa. was like so scared to be alone or in the house, bro. I don't know what I would do if I could no longer be home alone. <laughs> You'd be screwed. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, anyway, that's just the quickie. Just uh, a quickie. Just a little quickie. Last week I said that I had found a submission by mm-hmm. someone. Mm-hmm. And it said, being from the Navajo Nation, I have seen a lot of crazy shit. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> so disclaimer, I am not Navajo. I don't know the culture extensively so if i get anything wrong sorry but i'm just out here trying to tell some stories you know what i'm saying skirt skirt okay so this person said um having grown up on the navajo nation or in the navajo nation they have a ton of different stories so they've collected some from their friends from uncles aunts things like that so first one is actually something that happened to this person who submitted Uh uh-huh And when she was younger, her sister had a baby and her sister's husband was called away to work for a couple weeks. So he'd be gone. So her sister asked her if she would stay with her and help her with the baby and kind of like help her with some of the chores because it's a newborn, right? Mm -hmm. So she agrees. She's a teenager at this time. Um, She goes to her sister's house, which is a trailer way out in the middle of nowhere. There's no neighbors for five miles. It's out in the middle of nowhere. And for the first week, nothing happens. Business as usual. But in the middle of the second week, every night as they're going to bed, they start hearing tapping on the side of the trailer. And so for the first two nights, they're kind of weirded out by it, but it's just light tapping. They, They think possibly an animal. I don't know. But the third night, the tapping turns to scratching. And then aggressive scratching. And by this point, they're pretty freaked out. And uh, it it starts scratching on one side of the trailer. And then they can hear like a scuffle and scurry. And then it's scratching harder on the other side. And it keeps switching back and forth. 
And so finally kind of fed up, she says she just musters all the courage she can and she's going to go outside and confront whatever this is. So she throws the trailer door open and jumps out. And as she does that, she sees a shadow whip around the side of the trailer. Like what kind of shadow? Like someone moving really fast. Oh. So she starts. So not really a shadow, like a more of a figure. More of a figure. It's dark. She can't see it, but she knows it's. Yeah, it's nighttime. It's way dark. And she sees a figure like run around the side, the left side of the trailer. So she takes off sprinting after it. And she yells like, you better get out of here. And as she comes around the corner, the shadow that was just there is now way across the, the, the whole yard. And it's moving through the clotheslines. What? And she said it moved from where it was to the clothesline impossibly fast. And so that's like her first. She like stops and looks at it. It runs through the clothes and she sees it like sprint through the clothes and like push like a sheet of, a sheet away or something. And there's a utility pole that's way past the clothesline. It runs to the utility pole and scurries up super fast. Hell no. And in one of its hands, it's holding something. So it's doing this one handed and gets to the top. So she can see this figure at the top of the pole. And she said the whole yard is filled with a laugh the figure starts to laugh so it's just like almost cackling at her and by this time she's freaked out Mm. and then as it's laughing it jumps down off the pole and sprints at the trailer so comes back well she yeah yeah but near the other side of the trailer like it's going for the front door now because she's now like behind the trailer So it sprints out and it's running towards the front door. So she runs as fast as she can, turns the corner expecting to see someone either looking in the window or trying to get in the front door. Uh And as she comes around the corner, nothing's there. Fuck that, dude. So she looks under the trailer, looks around the back, looks around the front, nothing. Goes inside, tells her sister everything that's happened. Next morning, she goes outside and she said she can see footprints all around the trailer and footprints leading up to the utility pole. And they're barefoot human footprints with one exception. Mm -hmm. They have really long like uh, claws coming out the tips where the toes should be. And when it dropped down and it jumped down from the utility pole, she saw it drop the thing it was holding in her hand. So she went to the utility pole and her niece's little shirt is lying like crumpled in a, in a little ball. So it was holding the baby's shirt as it was laughing. They, that day... Her and her sister left the res and went to their her their mom's house who had moved away from the res a couple years ago and they like didn't come back until the husband was ready to come back. Right. That's the right move. <laughs> <laughs> I love I second good. that. <laughs> yeah. The part that made like my heart sink was like synonymous with hers when you know this thing's tapping. <laughs> And there's multiple ways to react to that, depending on who you are for her. It bothered her to the point where she wanted to take care of it. So she stepped out and she's ready to handle this. The thing runs around the side of the trailer and then she follows it and her heart drops as she sees this thing. Like, impossibly far. Like, there's no way any human could have gotten, like, crossed this distance mm-hmm. in that amount of time. And from there, she saw it climb up the pole. And she was like, I want to get away from this now. But, like, how her emotions changed and that had to have been, what, 15, 20 seconds? Like, a split second, yeah. yeah. Right. And I think that's, like, 
why he started laughing. Mm. He's, he's like, now you see Ooh, my power. That's a good, um, yeah, that's a good point there. Also, side note, in my extensive research of uh, footprints, mm-hmm. something that I notice is that like, regardless of how like the tips of your toes are, or in case of like a four-legged animal, the way that you step and then like bring your feet up, it like, kind of makes it look like it comes to a point just the way that your feet come up. Hmm. So maybe the way that it was is just like actual regular footprints, but they kind of had this pointed look to them just because of the way they were running. She said it looked like each toe had a claw. Yeah, no. I just, that like dug in deeper. That's sketch yeah that's just her one experience she said that's her scary her personal scariest experience <clears throat> how irritating though to have that tapping <laughs> bruh i'd run out there too i'm, I'm trying to sleep <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would be that would yeah yeah that would be oh well, yeah but i think it, it's in line with what leah told us it's like a lot of their goal is to just scare yep um Dude, I heard tapping on my window a few nights ago. And then you took out your earplugs and it was me snoring. <laughs> <laughs> Three <Whoa>. floors down. <laughs> no, I uh, woke up and heard the tapping and realized my window was open and that the cords to the blinds were like going. Psh, mm. psh, psh. But for a brief second, I was like, I'm on the third floor. What the fuck is going <laughs> that, on right that, now? that is kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> what if you just saw like a man standing outside just tapping? He'd be, Ugh. Dude, I don't know. <laughs> I probably would have punched right through that screen. Just <laughs> clocked it. Next story. Keep on coming. From dog. her tales. Please. So this one happened to her friend when she was a lot younger. So I think back in like 2000. Um, her family was having a family reunion and they decided to go up into the mountains. So they went way out into the Chuska Mountains. Which, Sean, where are those? Those are in Colorado, southern Colorado, next to New Mexico. Okay. And, and it's on Navajo Nation, right? Uh, I think so, yeah, yeah. Okay. The res down there. So or they go out to this cabin in the Cheska Mountains for a family re- reunion, and she describes it. It's like almost in a clearing or meadow, and it's surrounded by trees. So there's this cabin, and then in near the tree line, there is a stone well. And they do typical family reunion things. They're like playing um, football. They're playing tag. They do like three-legged races and just all the fun things. They have a barbecue and they eat or picnic. And it's getting dark. So they decide to turn in for the night. So the adults are sleeping in the two bedrooms. And all the kids are sleeping in the living room. So anywhere you can find on the ground or couch, they just like, good luck, you know? Mm -hmm. Nice. And she's lying there and she hears all her cousins fall asleep. And she can't sleep. And she's restless. So she's tossing and turning and just kind of annoyed, you know. Freak, I can't go to sleep. She says, inexplicably for no reason, her anxiety and her like restlessness turns to fear. And she almost like she can feel something in the air. And she's lying in the middle of the room of all her cousins. And she sits up and she looks over. It's a full moon outside. So it's like a little bit light coming through the windows. She sees a huge shadow come across the window. And her dad was telling her just that day that they need to be careful to not leave any food out out because there's there's bears up here. And she's like, there's a bear on the porch. And she hears it slowly walking on the porch as it's like creaking the wood and the shadow goes around to the front of the house where she can see the front door and she sees that her family didn't lock the front door but she's like okay you know what are the odds that the bear is going to turn this knob right she's watching the door and it lightly shakes like this like someone's pushing on it and the knob starts to turn And at this point, she's paralyzed with fear. Knob turns. There's a click of the lock and the door opens. 
Holy. And she can see the outline of this bear. And the second the door opened, the whole cabin is filled with this putrid smell. Ugh. And she yells, Dad! Dad runs in, sees the bear, and yells, Hank, grab the gun. That's her uncle. And as he does that, bear takes off. Hank grabs the rifle. They run out onto the porch, and they can see the bear behind the well. So Hank takes aim at it, and they hear it, ching, ricochet off the well. And as that, that happens, they're all watching it. The bear stands up on two legs. And it's now an outline of a huge, hairy man. And it runs away into the forest. <laughs> and they never see it again. It runs away on two legs? Yep. Because oh, bears can stand up. No, no, no. This but... thing stood up. <laughs> And, and sprinted ran. away like yeah, a man, right. like a huge man. Oh, well. And so the title of that was My Cousin Saw Bigfoot. Dude, that could be Bigfoot. <laughs> I was going to say, show me a bear with opposable thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, handy. I left doors. out one part. When it opens the door, she says she sees a human hand like reach in the door. And that's when she yelled, Dad. Hmm. Hmm. But she still wasn't sure, and they all thought it was a bear until they shot at it, and it stood up, and all of them knew that it was not a bear. Well, that's a little terrifying way to meet Bigfoot. I'd prefer it to be under, you know, more friendly circumstances. <laughs> I'd like to have uh, some coffee with him first. <laughs> yeah, maybe some, some beef jerky, some berries. Yeah, or yeah. beef jerky. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The last one. Have you guys ever heard of Kachina dolls? Kachina? Kachina. Like and I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. K-A-C-H-I-N-A? K-A-C-H-I-N-A. Mm-mm. It sounds familiar. Okay. So according to this post and my limited knowledge, Kachina dolls were originally made by the Pueblo Indians. And they were made by specific like medicine men. Mm -hmm. And they were used for things. Some people in the comments said that you use it. They're like entities that you can give tasks to. And what I know is Navajos are like terrified of Kachina dolls. Hmm. And so it's super bad luck to have them. Hmm. I was thinking like those like those uh, Russian dolls that you stack (laughs) inside of (laughs) each other. So apparently, like the Pueblo medicine men would make them and then they would put hair in the center of them and sew them in. So would they be like voodoo dolls where they could control people or did like that that hair give life to the Kachina dolls or like how did that work? So like the history behind them is originally like like I kind of said, they were made by the Pueblo Indians mm-hmm. um, and they're used for different things. So they become invested through ceremony. And so you can, they can either be um, invested with, like all things, benevolent spirits for good things, but also malicious spirits. And so you can definitely like get on the bad side of these dolls. And so you would give them tasks, the dolls. So some of the tasks would be like one to protect your house, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But some people would give them tasks that are... uh, Like kill my neighbor. Attack people. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, that's like where they kind of started, at least according to this. Can you make one that becomes a successful musician? <laughs> <laughs> Let's find out. No, but they, they become really commercialized. So when the railroad hit, um, the Cochina dolls became commercialized and people just bought them. So to Western culture, they were like nothing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But Navajos are like, hell no. They're like not about it. It's uh, real quick. I think it's funny how like because it's not your culture, you're not afraid of it at all. You're not mm-hmm. afraid of it at all. <laughs> it's like almost a joke to you. Uh-huh. 
Because I remember going to the Philippines and hearing all their superstitions and their monsters and whatnot, and none of them ever creeped me out. I just like laughed at all of them. And they're sitting there like, "You monster!" <laughs> <I know. laughs> Scary. All thing these people that be... like it's what terrified them as children, and uh, I don't know. I'm sure they feel the same about us. Yeah. <laughs> but well, according to this, the Navajo are not down with the Kachina doll. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, so. <clears throat> This is another story from the person who submitted the post. This happened to her cousin back in the nine Kachina dolls. Yep, back in the nineties. So her cousin recently moved to a new town. She found a trailer to rent at a really nice price. So she rented this trailer and the landlord just warned her, Hey, I haven't moved all my stuff out, but I will over time, okay? So yeah, there there's that. She's like, totally cool, whatever. Gets there, gets into the trailer. Opens it up, looks in, and there's a man. There's like a fireplace and a mantle over the fireplace, and on the mantle is a whole collection of Kachina dolls. <laughs> and so instantly, cousin's like, "Hell no!" Super wary of it. Um, knows it's super taboo to own them, um, but she's gonna respect the landlord's stuff and just go about her business. So first night in there, she's sleeping. And as she's drifting off to sleep. No way. First night. First night. <laughs> There's a whole mantle full of these mother effers. <laughs> she's drifting off to sleep. And she hears a thud. Nope. So she gets up to investigate, turns on the lights, goes into the living room or the living room space. And the Kachina dolls are lying on the floor in front of the mantle. So she picks them up, puts them back on the mantle. Mantle goes back to bed. 30 minutes later, she hears a nice, another little thud. Like how close, like this thud is in the room? Well, she's like back in the bedroom. Yeah. And this is like in the living room space in the trailer. It's not a huge trailer, but there's still separate rooms. Yeah. Yeah. But like that was a thud close to her or was it like, I know the trailer's not big, so everything's close, but like it's loud enough to where she can hear it. See, that was her first mistake, though. You don't acknowledge those. You just let it happen and ignore it. Probably. That's probably the right answer, actually. <laughs> but nonetheless, she puts them back on the manual mantle one more time and goes back to bed. This time, she's weirded out. Uh, I mean, at first, I think she was trying to ignore it just for self-preservation, you know? Well, I mean, like, this is the time that weirds her out. <laughs> so she's lying in bed, hears the thud. But this time, after the thud, she hears light little footsteps. Oh, no. (laughs) On the ground. (laughs) Little Chucky's running towards your freaking room, dude. (laughs) So she jumps up, runs into the living room, turns on the light. And the dolls are now on the other side of the room away from the mantle. Dude, this is just Toy Story. Like horror (laughs) Toy Story. Sid. Sid. (laughs) So she picks them up, puts them in a box put something on the box and puts them in her closet. No, nope. oh, that's they're closer to you now. And she said all night she could hear little scratches and movements in the box. The next day she called the landlord and made him come get the box and take them away. Good choice. I would let, I would empty them out of that box and line them up and have them run towards me <laughs> while I run and, punt them (laughs) bro i bet there's like bad juju though like you don't know what they're capable of you know i would cut a little hole in the box take one of those little things out let them run (laughs) towards me while the rest of them watch and punt it and then dismantle it and be like this is i mean business but what if they got like curses and stuff i think sean's idea of ignoring it's the the best idea till the morning (laughs) yeah i put my earplugs in put my Lock that damn door until it stabs you in the neck or something. Oh, yeah. Can they like, like, change form to like go under a door or something? Like, is that is that like a possibility for these things? Man, I don't know. If you're out there and you know anything about Kachina dolls, hit us up, please. Educate us. I don't even know what these look like. I'm gonna, yeah, yeah. Look up a photo. Kachina, Kachina. Whoa, these things don't look like very friendly things. Oh. Yeah, if those things were on the mantelpiece, just like coming yeah. towards you. Chucky here. No. Hell no. 
So this last one is from the submitter's grandma. From the person who wrote this story's mm-hmm. grandma. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is back in the 70s. 70s were a dark time. <laughs> Dude. They made a show So about many it. reasons. <laughs> so her grandma decides she's going to spend the night at her cousin's house who's on the res. So they go. They're hanging out. They're telling scary stories, trying to spook each other out. Nice. When her cousin says, let's play with the Ouija board. Nope. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Gang, gang. So it's like 9 p.m. Take out the Ouija board. And on, they just, the on the res. On the res. And they're alone. And they're like they're like 10 and 11. Okay, continue. Sorry. Bro. <laughs> so they're all alone. And they start asking this Ouija board questions. And nothing seems to happen. So they go back to telling stories. They have like a snack. They're going to get ready to go to bed. They thought this out with the snacks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, I was going to ask, what's your favorite snack? But hold on. I got a story to tell you. Ouija board's like hot? Cool Ranch yeah. Doritos. <laughs> yeah. Like, damn, bro. <laughs> Thanks, G. <laughs> uh, anyway, so they're about to go to bed when they decide, let's try one last time. You know, it's, it's later. You know, it's past 12 now. They pull out the Ouija board and they start asking it questions. Until they ask the question, are you here? And the Ouija board slides down to yes. And they're both convinced that the other one's doing it. Right. But they're a little creeped out. And then they ask, where are you? And the Ouija board (laughs) spells out the word chimney. And so they look over their shoulder and behind them is the chimney. And earlier that night, someone had built a fire. So it's still warm. And they go over to the chimney and they look up the chimney. And they said about five feet up the wall, inside the chimney, hanging was a Kachina doll. Oh, hell no. And so they see that, put the Ouija board away. Grandma was terrified and to this day has never played with the Ouija board again. That's hilarious, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Them Kachina dolls are... Honestly, are you sure they're Kachina dolls or just like trolls? Like <laughs> the Troll. toys with like the neon color hair. <laughs> or like those, I'm pretty sure it was Kachina. <laughs> like garden gnomes, dude. There's a whole conspiracy theory around garden gnomes. Are you serious? I'm dead serious. Oh my gosh, people are bored. <laughs> <laughs> Bro. <laughs> Go down this YouTube rabbit hole one time. I Garden will, okay? <laughs> conspiracy theories. But that sounds terrifying. Like, looking up the chimney, you're completely helpless. You, something <laughs> says it's up the chimney, and you look up the chimney. That's dumb. Oh, I am not looking up no chimney, bro. <laughs> For real. Uh, real quick, today... I was doing a lot of studying for a story I thought I was going to share tonight, but I'll share it next time. But I learned an interesting fact that is morbid. Talk to me. So when the Europeans went down to Aotearoa or New Zealand, one of the most popular things to trade with them, can you guess? Teeth. Close. Fingers. Ears, scalps, tongues, heads. Uh, I was getting all around it. So it got so popular and there was so much head trade. Like some of the Maoris would capture. uh, Dude, this is sick. They would have like a bolt full of um, prisoners of Maoris and the Europeans would choose which one which head was the best Ugh. and they'd kill that person um like boil the head leave it out in the sun and it would like shrivel mummify up. not like mad shrivel but it would like mummify you can look at photos of them that's disgusting but they did this so much that at one point the cost of a maori head was two pounds two pounds yeah that's it that's hella messed up. So bro. there's your morbid history fact of the day. That's dirt, dude. <laughs> no, dude. Crazy.
crazy. Like along those lines of like insanely morbid stories of European expansion. <laughs> Not funny at all. I don't know why I'm laughing. Uh, when the Europeans went down to Tasmania. Like south of Australia. Mm-hmm. One of the games that they would play was they would bury the aboriginals up to their oh, necks. Oh, I've seen this. And they would just kick their heads off. So you I wake up, have seen that being a get thing. breakfast, and that. then go give a head a couple kicks, and then go about your day. When you came home, <laughs> kick it some more until it was nothing. Wow. That's crazy because in their head, they were just thinking that these were animals which but, didn't make it okay but it's like they didn't see them as humans that's how much they didn't see them as humans yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. uh aboriginals were technically by law considered livestock until the 70s mm-hmm. when the laws were changed Jeez, <laughs> wild wow i've seen people like Aotearoa. do that with like chickens Aotearoa. Aotearoa. Te. Aotearoa. Aotearoa. Okay. Aotearoa. You gotta pronounce some tribe names for me, dog. Okay. <clears throat> you know what Aotearoa means? The land of the long white cloud. Because all the mountains when they got there were all snow capped and just looked like a long cloud. Did you ever see the Deadlands? No. Yeah, dude, Deadlands is it? gnarly, it's bro. Pretty dope, dog. Yeah, it's like, dude, I learned. Uh, I learned. Damn it. Okay, this is stuff I'm gonna share next time. <laughs> but the Mere Punamu is one of their weapons. Greenstone. Yep, the jade. Mm-hmm. But it used to be a weapon. Yeah, yeah. They now you see them as a necklace. Yeah, it used to be a, a weapon, mm-hmm. and it is specifically designed to break like shoulder blades or kill you with one blow to the head. They'd hit mm-hmm. you right here at the weakest part of your skull. And where that came from, the end of the Mere Punamu or the Punamu, the bottom of it has a very peculiar shape. And it's shaped like a vagina. Because the legend goes that Maui, the demigod, who was a lot like Hercules, was trying to attain um, immortality. And so he was given a task by the gods. And his task was to sneak into a woman's vagina and sneak out. So he had to enter and be reborn. Um, but Maui had two birds as like his companions. Mm-hmm. And when they saw him trying to sneak up into that bajajay, they started laughing. And it woke the woman. She saw Maui and what he was trying to do. And like, crushed his head killed him and because of that all men die we're all mortal because he couldn't accomplish the task and the bottom of the punamu is a vagina and it's the last thing you see before they kill you that's wild (laughs) i tell you i was listening to joe rogan and he had roseanne Barr on who, if you don't know, Roseanne Barr is like a, a comedian who had a sitcom back in the 90s. So she has since moved to big the Big Island and she has a farm. But they were just talking about the in, insanely amazing feats of the early Polynesian uh, sailors. And how they were able to navigate, get around, and like go back and forth on these islands. And with all of their advanced techniques, one of those was Joe Rogan's favorite. And it was when there was no stars out, no wind, and there was no visible current, they had to know which way the current was going under the water. So what they do is they get really low to the water and they would dip their ball sack into the water and the sensitive skin of the balls would be able to tell which way the water was going. Oh my gosh. (laughs) So apparently that's like... Makes too much sense. (laughs) I don't know if that's real, dog. We should look that up. <laughs> I personally have not heard that. <laughs> that's some Howley like freaking folklore. Howley's making that up. Did um, you know? I do know that they use the current to tell the direction of where they should go if they couldn't use the stars or the moon mm. or the wind 
or anything else, or maybe they use it in conjunction with the others. But I don't know about like using <laughs> your testes <laughs> as part of that. But I don't know. Um, to test the sea. Oh, what? Indigenous people are wild. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go out and say it, dog. <laughs> one of uh, one of the famous ancient Hawaiian sports was spear catching. <laughs> I played this. <laughs> and <laughs> it's exactly what you think it is. And people have died playing this sport. <laughs> yeah. And King Kamehameha the Great, who united all eight islands under one kingdom. Soon to be portrayed by The Rock. <laughs> Soon to be portrayed by Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. The <laughs> <laughs> Um He was famous for being one of the best at this game. It was said he could catch up to eight spears. He would catch some of them and use the ones that he caught to knock the rest away. Shh, shh. Yeah, bro, that's going to be in the movie. Him. You know, that's a hundred percent. Yeah, King Kamehameha <laughs> was also known to lift the Naha Stone, which I've seen. The Naha Stone is like sitting uh, in Hilo in the Big Island, and it's like this huge slab of rock. Almost, it looks as big as like one of the stones in like Stonehenge. Damn. Maybe bigger, but like he was not like whoever could pick this up would. The legend was whoever picked it up would unite all of the islands, and it was him, bro. And that's why the creator of Dragon Ball Z named the Kamehameha wave after Ooh. him because he was so powerful. Whoa, that's dope. Anyway, the more you know, I have a story. <laughs> yes, so. On one of the previous episodes, I spoke about Korean shamanisms. And this woman comes from L.A. And she is full Korean, as is her family. And this is her experience. As a little girl, she remembers having the typical family gatherings. And they were somewhat stooped in... American traditions, um, because they remember, or she remembers, certain people being there, and she knew that some of them were her cousins and her aunts and uncles that they only really saw at these family gatherings. And then she noticed that their next family gathering, one of her uncles didn't show up. And this uncle ended up not showing to anything for the whole year and this went on for a few years until one thanksgiving everybody was together and the uncle was there and it was her first time seeing him since she was a child at this point she was a teenager Mm -hmm. she thought it was strange for him to just not show up at any time and then appear and then nobody really talked about it he came over And she remembered it, I don't know, being kind of surreal because she thought people would make a bigger deal, but nobody did. Almost like no one was just... It was just... Acknowledging it? As if like it just picked up from the last time he was there, you know? Hmm. So she remembers as a teenager asking her mom what happened and why her uncle was gone. And all the mom said was, your uncle stepped on a woman, and the woman died. And she took that and sat with it for a long time. Until in her, I want to say mid-20s, so at least 10 or so years later, she thought of that experience again. And she decided to investigate. So she opens up her laptop. She goes to Google. And she searches her uncle's name. And she sees the history of everything that happened. Such a career, dude. (laughs) I must study. (laughs) (laughs) So, as she's reading... She finds that her uncle was a deacon at this Presbyterian church. 
And the reverend at this church was also Korean. And when he was starting out as a reverend or studying to become one, he took some time to learn about Korean shamanism. Now, Korean shamanism, from what I understand, typically only women become shamans. Interesting. Hmm. Because of their naturally and typically benevolent spirit and nature about them. They're more in tune, maybe? More sensitive. More of a maternal type. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. That's funny. I For some reason, like, as you're saying this, I really feel like sometimes women are more specialty instruments and men are like blunt tools. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, so that, that would make sense to me. I don't know. Really, all I can think about is 21 Jump Street. Don't fuck with Korean Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> he we'll, had his own korean problems and we'll, shit we'll get to that <laughs> um and apparently in a, like a long time ago the shamans were really respected and really looked up to in society <clears throat> then there was a huge societal change and change in like the social structure basically men took the forefront so everything that women did was seen as secondary and shamanism was one of them. In fact, that was pushed even lower to the status of peasants. So this shamanism and this culture and practice went into obscurity because of that. But this reverend wanted to learn about it and learned about one of the practices. And I think the pronunciation is gut. Is G-U-T. Gut? Mm-hmm. And basically... It's exorcisms. Oh. So where the uncle comes into play is when he's working at the church. At some point, the reverend's wife inherits an evil spirit. Hmm. And they need to perform a casting out, an exorcism, or good. One night, the reverend calls the uncle to come over. The uncle shows up. And they sit his wife in the middle of the room. And at this point, apparently the wife is just incoherent, can't communicate, at least from her own being and from her own free will. At this point, she's speaking to them in other voices that aren't her own. Hmm. So as they are talking to these demons that are living in his wife, they ask... They ask him what, you know, what's your purpose? Who are you? Mm-hmm. And the person replies, Gunde or Gundai. Gundai. Mm-hmm. And all of them speak Korean. And the direct translation of Gundai is many Ooh. or legion. Ooh. But... Legion, we are many. Exactly. Well, the context of that. So in the New Testament of the Bible, there's a story where a man is sick and Jesus finds him and asks pretty much the same thing. You know, why are you here? Who are you? And the person replies, Legion, for we are many. And Jesus casts them out and all of the spirits went into a herd of swine and all the swine ran off the cliff and killed themselves. So does that sound right? Is there any more? No. Okay. Uh, If you are a Christian and you believe in the Bible, then you full on believe in possession, possession of children, being possessed by a legion, possession of pigs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And it was always weird to me that like, you would meet Christian people who like don't or who don't believe in possession. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, that's definitely strange. They're like, no, that doesn't happen. And it's like, well, if you believe in the Bible, like, like <laughs> apparently Jesus it do. himself, <laughs> yeah. you know, was <laughs> dealing with this on the daily. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, this voice replies, Gundai. 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 You know. Was it like in that deep voice though? Or like. Like Gundai, so I, I, it was that would uh, be scarier. It, it, it was like a male voice as they 
out of they put this it. guy's wife. Yep, out of this guy's wife. So one of the in good they don't use they don't use plants or herbs as part of their ritual process to reach some state of being. Mm-hmm. They use instruments. Like Ooh. musical instruments. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. Drums, things like that. So the husband is trying all these different things with different instruments and nothing's working. So one of the other practices he wants to try to force the demon out is physically forcing the demon out. Through pain or something? Not necessarily, but they would. uh, Basically what they eventually did was they laid her out. So she was laying down flat on her back. They start at her feet and they would just like gently or like somewhat firmly like push, you know, up starting from the bottom. They were massaging her. Oh, yeah, pretty much to push this demon out. Literally. Literally. And as they're doing this, she's writhing and just doing like contorting and it's, it's not a pretty sight. And as they're getting closer to her upper body, it's getting more intense, almost like it's working. Mm -hmm. And basically the husband says that he wants to force these demons out of her mouth. So they're working their way up to her mouth. And as they're getting closer, the demon says, you're not taking me out of her only over her dead body. So at that point he starts to get more aggressive and he stands up, takes a step closer to her body and steps on her chest. And Almost as like the only thing I can think of is on a trampoline and you're trying to super bounce your friend. (laughs) He presses down with both feet on her chest. And there's a crack. Her sternum. And she lets out one final breath. So... This woman is reading all of this online about her uncle. Sick. <laughs> and his boss, who's the reverend of this church. And this woman dies from blunt force trauma. And she has about 16 fractures in her ribs and internal bleeding. And... The uncle was charged for Ugh. manslaughter. He, I, I don't think he was the one who actually stepped on. Well, I don't think he took part in that. It was just the the woman's husband. But that's what he went away for. For a few years. And then he came back. And came showed up at Thanksgiving dinner. Hi, uncle. And you been stepping on anyone recently? <laughs> <laughs> and that's why the family was the way they were. It wasn't some... Big deal. They, they just all tried knew. to treat it normally. They all knew, and she was a kid. Nobody was going to tell her, you know. Yeah. And here she is as an adult reading this online, and you can search it too. Oh. The woman who unfortunately passed away. Her name is Kyung Jai Chung. I could probably be butchering the pronunciation, but it's K Y U N G J A E C H U N G. And I think she was in her 50s at the time when all of that happened. Husband was the same age, and they had, I think, two kids. Oh, gosh. That's heavy. That is heavy. So I was thinking back to family functions and thinking about extended family, people that I knew who were notably different (laughs) And I think they're all good. (laughs) But stay alert. This reminds me of the family reunions before I grew my beard and then afterwards where everyone thought that I uh, had something wrong and started doing drugs and everything because I (laughs) grew a beard. 
damn, bro, that's like <laughs> quite a jump for to like conclusion. a straight years. Like, oh man, you looked way better without. Like, you should get rid of it. <laughs> Be like, I have a suggestion. Eat a dick, grandma. <laughs> oh, she's dead. Ah! When I uh, eat a ghost dick, grandma. <laughs> When I told my mom that uh, I wasn't going to go to school anymore, I wasn't going to go to college anymore. Yeah, what's the most disappointed your parents have been in you? <laughs> no, <I'm just> kidding. <laughs> she literally thought that I was like getting into drugs or something. Oh. And then there I was in that Wendy's. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what a sprain crunching ankle along. Crutches. I don't know about the other What'd one. you guys learn from this episode? Dude, there was, we were all over the place this episode, to be honest. A, don't fuck with Korean Jesus. <laughs> B, we're not playing with any of those Kachina dolls. I'm not having them anywhere near my house. And then C, after I see the shadow the first time, I'm saging the house. Yep. So that's what I'm taking with me today. Yeah, definitely don't double bounce your wife's chest. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the phrase uh, "get to step in" is taken quite literally <laughs> yeah. in uh, some cultures, I guess. <laughs> Stomp the yard. Okay. Oh, fuck. Uh, <laughs> my wife is the yard. <laughs> I am the stomp. <laughs> uh, shout out the internet for my story. It was by a user of the name. Osteo Rock. <laughs> nice. Uh, did I tell any more stories? Shout out Seth. He was the one who told me the break in story. Oh, dang. happened to his friend in high school. Dang. Shout out my coworker and friends back east. I ain't shouting out nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Next episode, I got a story from my friend in New Zealand who works in a mental hospital. Fuck. He wrote me with another one. He said, since same one, mm-hmm. same friend, different said, story. Since I sent this in, he's like, I'm starting to remember all these things. Dang, dude. So he sent us another one, and this one is intense. Sick. I'm excited, bro. <laughs> oh, damn. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. <clears throat> super, super grateful for you. Yeah, we're happy doing this, and we're happy that uh, <laughs> these stories are uh, a part of your week. So, um, if you, wait, do we have any light stories or no? I have one light story. Cool. It actually came in some of my research of like some stories back, uh, East. And this happened in a town in the Ozark mountains. The town was called, well, it was in Douglas County in the Ozarks in around 1940. There kind of started this urban legend of the Angel of Ava. The Angel of Ava ultimately was probably just a person, but what they would do throughout this county is they would just go and leave like $100 bills in people's mailboxes. And then in the 1940s, that's like 2000 bucks. Dang. And so this legend or folklore just grew there in the, in the, uh, in the county and Everyone was just like, had this kind of pay it forward type mentality where they helped people out and they were helped out in return. That's sick, bro. You know, I was like, well, that's kind of cool. I wish someone would put $100 and even like $20 in my mailbox. Yeah, nice hit us right up, now. Angel of Ava. <laughs> hit us up anytime you want. That's cool. There can be nice hauntings out there. True. Yeah, Angel of Ava. Um, my Venmo handle is <laughs> at. D E E J A Y P A S I K A L A D J Pasikala. So there we go. Thanks. Just shout out. <laughs> hey, shout also, out Angel Ava. Shout out Angel Ava. Also to all of our listeners. If, shout you out, listeners. Shout out for <laughs> real. And if you would like to support us, like we don't we don't really go out on this ledge very much, but like if you'd like to support us, definitely like and comment on our podcast. Give on, me money. <laughs> on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, and Instagram, also, like yeah. all our posts, if you could like and comment, like hundred percent. And also, also, what was it? Downloading our episodes. Downloading our episodes also matters. So, yeah, no, we love all of the support that you guys are giving us. But rate and review, all of that. Yeah, 
we hate to like sell ourselves like that and say those like like and subscribe it's like literally <laughs> the worst but i'm a slut so <laughs> i'll sell everything <laughs> but uh yeah if you do like these enough that's how you can show it yeah. um i don't know your <laughs> support that you like us yeah <laughs> yeah. At, yeah at the very most do everything sean just said but at the very least like just i don't know send us a message if you do oh, listen yeah. to this podcast and you like it dude those go so far every time we get one of those we all share them and talk about them and it just like boosts our morale because sometimes <laughs> it, a lot of work goes into this with research and editing editing takes like 10 hours a week <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. on top that. of our just already the jobs content too like putting together all the content and mm-hmm. gathering that like it's <laughs> takes a lot of work yeah. yeah and yeah in no way are we trying to guilt trip anybody Hell like no. we we have fun <laughs> doing this true um we just want other people to have fun on the receiving end so yeah um if that's the case help us to do this a little bit more so let us know your feedback or send us a story. We'd love to hear them. Yep. Send that to 3 a.m. podcast stories at gmail.com or just hit us up in our DMs on 3 a.m. pod on Insta. Yeah. And our friend that we, uh, one of our listeners told us, the ones that we met at FearCon, shout out Shaylee mm-hmm. and Trinity and Trinity's older sister that we met. And uh, they were telling us they had trouble writing out their stories um we just told them to record a voice memo and just tell it there and then send the voice memo itself so uh, whatever you want to do just get us your stories tell it in your voice uh the way you want it to be told um you can send that through through email as well so yeah we're excited to to receive them but uh yeah in the meantime bye love you be safe Uh, Trust your gut. Watch your back. And thanks for listening. Bye-bye. I actually liked when Laura at the end of the episode was like, sweet dreams. (laughs) Because I was like, oh, it's like a warning. Yeah. And remember, if you're... We should try to give like a warning at the end, but it's so hard. Since we like discussed some things. Yeah. Staple your anus. (laughs) Why? Cover your assets. Oh. Don't dip your your uh, scrot in the water to Yeah. And remember, don't play with Ouija boards. Don't have Kachina dolls. Don't get possessed and be Korean in LA. <laughs> don't go camping in the Appalachian Mountains. And that's it. Lock your doors. Lock your doors. There you go. Good night. See ya. Same dude.